Welcome to Motor Week. Coming up on this week's programme, we've a head-to-head -head test between a familiar and not-so-familiar executive cruiser. Plus, World Rally ace Colin McRae takes our very own Ken Gibson for a not-so-relaxing drive in the awesome Ford Focus RS. Now, it wasn't that long ago that if you'd seen the words Jaguar and Volvo together, it would have only been on Mr. Ford's shopping list. And to suggest that the two might become competitors, we would have been thrown out of town. But today, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're pitching the Jaguar S-Type head-to-head -head with Volvo's S80. But it's a much closer contest than you might think. And of course, it could be much worse. The weather could be bad. So, in the brick corner, the Jaguar S-Type SE. Yours for just over 32 grand. 3 litre V6, a top whack of 140 miles an hour and a very sexy cat on the bonnet. Now in the Swede camp we've got the Volvo S80 Executive. 2.8 litre V6, it's safer than Mike Tyson's wristwatch. It's got more toys than a kindergarten and it'll set you back a tickle over 31 grand. Now you may remember that when the S-Type was launched, Jaguar wanted to recreate a lot of that style of the 60s. And with those twin headlamps, the Mark II style grille and the copious curves, it certainly looks more retro than cutting edge. But Volvo have gone for a completely different approach with the S80. It's a lot more angular and aggressive than the Jag, but I've got to say that this car is very colour dependent. What I mean by that is if you buy it in battleship grey or dark brown, it looks like a brown or grey battleship, but in black, it looks every bit the sleek executive cruiser that it is. And like the Jag, it's very distinctive. So I don't think there's any doubt that with either of these cars parked on your drive, it will have the neighbours discussing your executive success. But what about when you get behind the wheel? So first up, the S-Type. Now powering this Jag, we've got a Ford Source 3 litre V6 and that produces 240 brake horsepower. Now as you'd expect, that power delivery is very, very smooth indeed. Although this isn't the fastest car in the world, 0 to 60 taking eight seconds. But having said that, it's got lots of that mid-range grunt which you need for overtaking on the motorway. Now should you find that you need to be at that important business meeting extra specially early, there is a switchable automatic box on this SE model and that basically allows you to hold the car in gear a little bit longer. Now if the engine in the Jag was respectable Middle England, well this thing has got a nutty Swede under the bonnet. Again it's a V6 but this time it's turbocharged giving you 270 brake horsepower and that acceleration is ridiculous. It'll get you to 60 in a shade over 7 seconds and that's a figure that most sports cars would be proud of. Now that acceleration is not something that you'd expect on a car of this size, or on a Volvo for that matter, and in a straight line it makes it much more exciting than the Jag. But it's on those bendy bits where the Jag has well and truly beaten the Volvo. Because this is rear wheel drive and the Volvo's front, this instantly feels a lot more stable and a lot more poised. And especially with the Volvo having all that power driving the front wheels, they can quite often leave you scrabbling for grip, but in the Jag it's just very, very precise. And another thing with the Volvo, when you're driving it hard, it does feel like a big luxury car. Whereas the Jag is very, very nimble and very chuckable. And in that respect, it is a lot more exciting to drive and more rewarding than the Volvo. But do you need that sort of performance in a luxury car that is going to spend 90% of its life on the motorway? Well, so far it's been a fairly even scrap, but this is where the tide is about to turn in favour of the Volvo. That's right, pick your kebabs up off the carpet because the interior of this car 
it's just a fantastic executive space. It feels really high quality. You've got these gorgeous leather electric seats. There's just about electric everything else. A fantastic stereo, but it's the space as well. It's absolutely cavernous in here. And especially in the back, there is absolutely loads of leg room. And I think you'd impress any of your customers if you're shuttling them around in this thing. Now it was quite a big surprise because quite often on Volvos the interiors are very bland but in here the cream leather and the colours and materials they've used on the dashboard they really go together to give you a really well thought out and spacious executive living room I guess. And believe it or not it's actually the interior of the S-Type that surprised me most. I was expecting something more like a Jag XJ but instead well set your sights more like a Mondeo gear. It feels alright, it's reasonable quality but the colours, it's so dark and this nasty walnut trim, this is definitely geared for the American market and Jaguar are the first to admit that it needs a change, in fact it is due for a facelift. That combined with the cabin space which is actually very very pokey and when you look at that against the Volvo, well there's no doubt about it, this is a small interior and I think when you're on your 300th mile on the motorway, big space is what you're going to want. I can honestly say that for a high mileage executive car, I would go for the Volvo. The Jag's nice, but this is just very, very impressive. But the Volvo's not a Jag, I hear a lot of you cry, which, if you're over 45, wear lots of sweaters and play golf, is a valid point. But looking at that 32 grand price tag, I just think the Volvo's got so much more to offer. I think it looks better, it's a lot bigger inside and it basically does a lot better job of feeling expensive and executive over the Jaguar. And if that's upset too many of you old stalwarts a little too much, go and eye in your knitwear, have a round of golf and look at the big picture, the times are changing. Question. If I were to ask you what your image was of motor rallying, I bet you that it would probably be mad keen enthusiasts wallowing about in the mud driving like lunatics. Well you would be amazingly wrong. Take a look inside here. If rallying doesn't quite fit into the same league as running an F1 team, that costs around about a hundred million pounds a year, it's catching up fast. It costs the Ford team in excess of 14 million a year to operate a team in the World Rally Championship. Just competing in one rally can cost over £1 million. Each car costs around £400,000 and Ford run 12 cars a year, so that's a cool £4.8 million. This is the amazing Ford World Rally Centre. It's a £2.4 million high-tech hospital for cars filled with skilled motoring surgeons who can perform things on cars that are unbelievable. The incredible thing is though, when I look around, the floor is absolutely spotless. I don't know whatever happened to the dirty mechanics, greasy overalls and workshops that look like the black hole of Calcutta. This really is a whole new world of rallying. They do tell me, however, that the mechanics do get themselves pretty dirty when they actually go out into the real stuff and get out to the nitty-gritty of rallying. But really this place is showing you just how far rallying has now come. It's no longer an amateur sport for enthusiasts, it's a multi-million pound business. And I believe that what I've seen here confirms what many people are saying, that within 10 years Rallying could well challenge F1 as the glamour sport of motoring. Now, you might be thinking what exactly rallying has got to do with the average man in the street. Is it just a nice game for the boys to play? Well, the answer is this car here, the RS Focus, which is about to become the jewel in the Ford Crown. And this car owes an awful lot to this car's technology. So let's go and see just how this car performs. OK. 
Okay, on away we go. Colin, first of all, what do you actually think the RS name gives to Ford? I think it's a, this car is something that all the hunters have been waiting for for a long time. Ford in the past have always had RS 2000, the Sierra Cosmo, the Escort Cosmo, and there was, a, there was a big gap after that now. You know, all that anybody ever asks is, you know, when are they going to bring out a Focus, when are they going to have a Focus road car, so the same as the rally car. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. How much input have you had into the car's development as it's been going on? We've driven the car on quite a few occasions, right from the beginning, right up until now. Um, I mean, the guys back at Bates have been, put, have been putting all the wee bits and pieces in. All we've been doing is driving the car, giving them a bit of feedback, suspension, brakes, engine performance, how it should react. You've sort of got a double take with this car because you can drive along at this speed through the town and it feels like a, a very nice comfortable road car uh, but there's also the, the RS side to the extreme side where the suspension starts to feel quite firm you get a very positive feel off the steering the engine response is what you want it really it's up to you and your right foot so I think they've built everything into this car It gives Ford an image car again, doesn't it? They've been producing very good cars with the, the Focus, Mondeo, Fiesta, all got a big reputation for driving cars, but there's nothing like real image, and the RS name is a name that just has that little bit of magic. Do you think that it's actually gonna be a big hit from an image point of view, a halo effect in the showrooms for Ford? I think it will be. It's, as I said earlier, it's something that everyone's been waiting for. They already know what RS is. They just want one. And uh, you know, I think when people do get their hands in this car, they're not going to be disappointed. Just how good is this car? You, you've driven some of the great sort of sporting cars over the years, rally, rally derived production cars. Just how good is this? I think it's a great car and it's better than all of the older ones because of the fact you can use it as an everyday car. You know, it's not a car that you'd be taking out of the garage now and again. If you want to use it every day, you can use it every day. The RS Focus arrives in December in showrooms and expect a price tag of around 20,000 plus, which is an awful lot for a Focus, but you get an awful lot of car with a 200 plus brake horsepower performance. Right, now this is the really exciting bit. They've promised me that I'm gonna get to drive the car now. This is gonna make my day. Colin, what are you doing in the driving seat? You're passenger now, I'm now in control. Who said that? The big man in there. Uh, messages got lost somewhere down the line. Uh, I'm driving. You're the passenger now. No chance, mate. No chance? What do you mean, no chance? See you later. After the break, Glenda Mackay drives the Alpha 147 Seller Speed, and Ian Royal's used car tip looks at the Porsche 911. If I was in a pub arguing with you about the all-time great hot hatches, it's hardly likely that the name Alfa Romeo would come up. Granted, they've made some fantastic cars, but they're nowhere near the cult status of the likes of Golf GTIs and Ford RS models. But the people in the know are saying that the latest Alfa, the 147, is destined for great things in the hot hatch world, following in the footsteps of the current hot hatch king. The Citroen Saxo. Now that's a tall order, if ever there was one. Over the last few years, Alfa have managed to get rid of that build quality that was best suited to a Hong Kong Christmas cracker, an electrics that could have had their own Wiring From Hell series. Now they've got the quality and reliability of the best of Europe, yet they still remain an individual and passionate car. Now being a hot-blooded Italian company, Alfa like to do things differently. And when it comes to interiors, this is a good thing. Style is the key word here. Looking more like a plain cockpit than a car interior, Alfa have really gone to town to make this car feel special. Compared to a Golf or a Seat, 
and well, there's no comparison. In general terms, where Alpha will score points over the competition is with their Latin design flair. There's no mistake in this 147 for a Golf, Beamer or indeed anything else on the road. And it's that identity that any cult car needs, be it a Mark 1 Golf GTI, Citroen Saxo or Alfa Romeo. Now the problem with most of today's hot hatches is that they're much bigger and heavier than the steeds of old and this Alpha is no exception. It feels like you're driving a much larger car than you actually are. That's not saying that the ride is bad because it actually feels quite sporty. It's just not one of those cars that you'd want to chuck into corners go-kart styly. If the ride is a little subtle for your taste, you'll love playing with the gears on this car as it's fitted with cellar speed. That's paddle change for you and me. Just like Formula One, you can keep your foot in and paddle away to your heart's content. Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be... Michael Schumacher! Though maybe not quite smooth enough for a racing car, the change is as smooth as any of the semi-automatic gearboxes we've tested and it's a doggle to use. Press right to change up and left to change down. Or you can use the floor-mounted gear stick if you're feeling sensible. The 2-litre engine in the cellar speed pulls really well once it's up and revving. And the all-important 0-60 time is a mild 9.3 seconds. But that's still quicker than a Saxo VTR and the Golf GTI 2-litre. And lift them all. Handling and performance aside, one thing that Alpha get right every time over their rivals is the engine note. The 1.6 we've been driving around sounds brilliant, and when you rev this two litre hard, absolute perfection. No need for any big four exhaust conversions here. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that from a sporting aspect, the 147 knocks a 2-litre Golf GTI for six. But there's a big issue of price. At 17 grand, the Alpha is not cheap. And where the previous all-time great hot hatches have shone is with cheap, no-frills performance. So... Maybe the Alpha 147 is a little bit too grown up and luxurious for the top 10 of pocket rockets, but as an individual passionate car, it's fantastic. And for all of you who think that Alpha have got the wrong image to be in the boy racer market, well, if Citroen can do it, I don't think Alpha will have much bother. Despite the fact that the Porsche 911 is now approaching middle age, it was 37 years since the first one was launched, and that it's been through five generations and been threatened with being killed off on more than one occasion unsuccessfully, there's something rather uniquely appealing about the 911 which no other car, not even a Ferrari, can match. And despite the fact that a new 911 now costs at least £56,000, there are plenty of good used examples to be found. For instance, this, a 1979 911 SC Targa. It's done 84,000 miles, it's had three owners, it's in exceptional condition for its age, and it would cost you £12,000. The 911 has so many unusual quirks to it that many people are put off buying them. For instance, the rear-mounted engine, which can make them a little tail-happy in the wet. But slip behind the wheel of a 911, start up the air-cooled engine behind you, and listen to that wonderful sound. Now, finding a good 911 can be a bit of a minefield, all the different models, variants and generations. So here's our guide on what to pay for one. A 1979 911SC Targa around £12,000. A 1987 911 3.2 Carrera with 100,000 miles, £15,000. An H-Reg 911 Carrera 4, 19 grand. Or how about the superb looking 911 Carrera Sport Targa 3.2 from 1988 for £17,500. 
So what do you need to check for on a 911? Well, certainly check all the way around the bodywork because many may have had a shunt or two and they've certainly been on track days as well, so they may have been thrashed. So a good check around all of the bodywork is essential. Make sure all the panel gaps fit correctly. The colour is the same all the way around the car. There may have been resprays and all sorts of things done. It's well worth getting a good independent Porsche specialist to check out a car like this. If you need a new clutch, that's going to cost you about two grand. Heat exchangers and exhaust systems are again expensive. <laughs> It's out on the road that will finally convince you whether to buy a 911. Once you've got used to its rather unusual habits, it's a car that can put a big smile on your face and it's quick as well. Find a dry, clear road, floor the throttle and you'll rock it off into the distance. And despite the fact that this is not an expensive 911, it's still got that envy appeal to other drivers who want to give you a race away from the traffic lights or tailgate you. So, have I got your mind racing that yes, you might fancy a Porsche 911? Well, my tips would be if you want one, read up and do your homework about the cars because there are lots of different models and variants available. Coupes, cabriolets, targas and turbos. Go to a specialist dealer who knows his stuff. And remember that cars over 10 years old will qualify for classic insurance, which should only cost you a few hundred pounds. So this week's used car tip is the Porsche 911.